What's good, y'all? Welcome to Conversation Peace with Patrick Armstrong. I am the titular Patrick, and this is a show where we talk about the missing pieces of the conversations we're already having. Shout out to our returning listeners, and a high five and hello to everybody joining us for the very first time. I appreciate you all being here in 2024, the year of the net. My guest today is a biracial, Korean-American, melancholy dreamer. She grew up in a multicultural home, and because of that, she spent her life navigating cultural collisions and liminal space. She is also the author of Tell Me the Dream Again, Reflections on Family, Ethnicity, and the Sacred Work of Belonging, a memoir that explores integrating ethnic identity and faith and what it means to be biracial in America today. She writes about faith, cultural, and ethnic identity and living with a shalom-sick ache. It is my honor and privilege to welcome Tasha June to the show. Tasha, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It is, I said this before we got on mic, but it's been a long time coming. We've connected quite a while ago, and I always wanted to have you on the show, always wanted to do it in person. And now that I'm finally making it happen on the show, we've been able to get you on. So I appreciate your patience with me as we got this set up. So happy to be here. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, but it's it hasn't really that been that long. <laughs> That's true. It really has. Time is a mister, a mysterious concept to me currently as a new father. Um, as you know, as a parent, it is fast. It's slow. I don't know what day it is, but <laughs> we're making it happen. Um, I gave you a little bit of an intro, but for folks who may not know who you are, do you mind sharing just a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I, um, yeah, you already said I'm a parent. I'm a mom of three. Um, and so my three kids, they keep me busy and that's where I spend most of my time. Um, I'm a writer been writing ever since I was in third grade. And so yeah. um, having a book that I've authored is one thing, but I've always been a writer. So yeah. Love it. What in third grade made you want to pick the pen up and start writing? Um, I don't know what made me want to pick the pen up. Um, but that was the first time that I received a journal. I named the journal BJ um, <laughs> and started journaling and um, have just have not stopped since then. So, okay. Yeah. Do you happen to still have that third I grade do journal? not have that journal. I'm pretty sure I threw it out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that journal anymore, but I started saving them. Um, I don't know, a few years after that. And I have boxes of them still. So very nice. Yeah. I wish that I had some of my old journals and stuff. I, for some reason I keep everything, but there are some things that I never keep huh. and I don't know where they go. Yeah. I, I, they should be in drawers. They're not in those drawers. So <laughs> they're gone. Um, do you remember what you first started to journal about? Was it just what's happening in my life? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Um, there was a lot that went on in my grade school years. Um, my family moved from the U S to Tokyo and, um, there was just a lot that happened, um, throughout that time. And so, it was really just a way for me to process. Mm. It didn't come out deep, you know, it was just a way for me to talk to someone that was not, you know, my parents or anyone that was actually in my life felt safe, you know, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of process what was going on. And, um, yeah, I've processed that way ever since then. It's been very therapeutic. Yeah. Writing so, is very therapeutic yeah. in that way. Um, so you came from Tokyo to the U S you talk about having moved around a lot in your earlier age. Can you talk about that experience as a kid, memories that you retain and carry with you now mm. as you navigate your life. Yeah, you know, I was just telling my husband recently that I think that having moved so much, you know, I'm so grateful for it now. At the time, it was really difficult. Um, and we we had some pretty big moves at some really tender mm. seasons in life. You know, we moved, um, we moved to Tokyo, then moved back to California where I was born. Um, lived there throughout junior high and then right at the end of junior high moved to Noblesville, Indiana. So you could just, I mean, imagine the contrast there. Right. Um, but so I'm thankful for all those moves now, but I think it, it took me kind of decades to recover from some of those, um, some of those moments of culture shock and just change. Yeah. What prompted the moves? Was it just like a, a work situation or? Yeah. Always a work situation. We moved to Tokyo, actually. Um, my mom is Korean. My dad is is white. And um, there was an opportunity to move to Asia. And it was a little closer to Korea. Sure. Sounds simplistic, but that's why we. <laughs> that's why he took it. No one else wanted it um, at the time. And so he took the position. And that was what enabled us to travel to Korea as, okay. as a kid, um, as a young family. Uh, but other than that, yeah, just work. So, yeah. yeah. Do you have memories from being able to travel to Korea at that time? I do, yeah. Um, we went over the summer. 
or of a multiple summers. And, you know, it was the first time that I had seen that I witnessed my mom in an environment that was home to her. Mm. Um, it was also the first time I was witnessing her reconnect with family that she had lost since, um, since she was a kid. And so, um, I, I definitely, those, those memories are really sharp for me. Um, yeah. Lots of emotion, lots of confusion too. Sure. Um, but yeah, um, I, I treasure them and they hold a lot of, a lot of deep stuff. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Did you feel a sense of home when you were there, um, even though it wasn't necessarily home right. in the way it is, was for your mom? Right. So when we, the first time we went, I remember as a kid being really excited and thinking, we're going to go to the place um, where all my favorite food comes from. Like just as a kid thinking yeah. it's going to be everywhere. Um, and I had heard about her talking about her family and was just excited to go. Um, so we, we flew from Japan, we flew from Tokyo but it was um, a shock for me. It was a shock for me to feel like I'm going home to a place that's supposed to be home and um, be completely unwelcomed. Sure. Um, there were a lot of moments where um, we went to Pusan, we were walking along the beach, and I, I think I write about this in my book, but um, there was a moment where these teenagers, and this was a while ago, um, just started spitting on my sister and I because we were a mixed race. And up until that point, I had no idea there were any feelings about, you know, mixed race Koreans. Um, and just some other some other situations where I was playing with some kids, um, family, friends, and this kid kept poking me with a toothpick. It could have just been a mean kid, but it felt very much like I was the, you know, there's one of these doesn't look like everybody right. else. But it was the first time I'd ever really thought about that as a Korean. So, um, at the same time, I had really great experiences too, loved it, sure. but it was very confusing. It was very confusing to go and feel like, okay, wait, I don't, I'm not seen as part of this place or this isn't, no one expects me to belong here. Sure. You know? Well, especially as a kid experiencing yeah. that. And then that becomes foundational in a way, right. like, even if it's just a confusion or that sense of unwelcomeness, it's like, how are you supposed to deal with that if you don't oh, have the yeah. language to deal with it? Yeah. Or if, like, your parents don't know, okay, this is something that you might experience. Yeah. And then you end up coming back to the U.S. You're in California where there is still a a not insignificant number of not just Asian folks but Korean-American folks. Um, what was that experience like for young you as you reached junior high? Were you able to find more sense of home there? I think in a way, I think, you know, I mean, we just, as kids, we just survive, right? You right. know, and the, I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, surviving war. I wasn't surviving, like, hung, nothing like that. Um, but emotionally, I knew there was difficulty. And looking back now, I'm like, oh, that's why I did that, because I was really struggling. But I right. didn't, didn't know that there was no language. We didn't have as much, you know, I mean, in the way of therapy or even just language <laughs> to place with what we were going through, right? Yeah. Um, so I just was really resistant, kind of shut down, um, resistant to want to go to school, you know, but it wore off. I made friends. Um, and the place that we were in, it was pretty diverse. There were a lot of mixed race kids. There was a lot of all kinds of kids. Um, and so I found other people who were similar to me. And um, and it was also really normal to be with people that were different. Yeah. So, um I would say I love that, but I don't know if I did. I think I just, it was easy to kind of build. Sure. Um, and then, and then we moved. <laughs> so. and, yeah, that's what I was, gonna, I was gonna say, you build up yeah. to this comfortability. Like you build a, a safety net, right? A, a, a sense of survival, which I wanna touch on before we get to Noblesville, yeah. because I feel like I hear, <laughs> I'm hearing this a lot, and I've heard this a lot over the last three years in the adoptee community, is that as kids, we had to learn how to survive. Mm. And I think that that's, that statement is, is really standing out to me now because like when you hear Gen X or boomers talk about, oh, we need, we want kids to be kids. It's like, it runs up against this idea that, well, us who have grown up now, we're only ever trying to survive. Were we ever kids? Do you feel like you got a chance to be a kid when you reflect on that experience now? Yeah, so I do in moments. I feel like, you know, there's such a tension there. There's so much nuance. I mean, there, I mean, I was such a wonder filled kid yeah. when I had the chance to, to be that way. Right. Sure. You know, um, always curious. And then when something would happen that would kind of throw me out of that, I don't know, you know, just looking yeah, yeah, back yeah. then it was more survival. Like, oh, I like to knocks you out. off track yeah. and then you're trying to figure yeah. out your way back so to I it. So I think there was both. I mean, I definitely, 
there were a lot of hard things that I've processed since, but I also had a really great childhood at the same time. Sure. So it's it's confusing, but it also makes sense, you know? A hundred percent. Well, it's like, I think the hard thing for a lot of us is understanding multiple truths, the yeah. the idea of multiplicity and the fact that all of these things can exist at the same time. Right. Even if it's confusing and difficult, um, we can wreck or maybe not reconcile, but we can understand it in the same breath as it like, oh, I had a great childhood or whatever it might be, uh, a a positive experience in whatever it is that I experienced at that time. Um, So you build a sense of safety and community, and then you uproot yourself from California, and you find yourself in Noblesville, Indiana. Yeah. Culture shock, you said, especially at a formative time of being, getting ready to go not only to middle school, but high school. Right. What was that experience like for you? Um, That was probably one of the most defining moments. I mean, it just, it really, I mean, more culture shock than I think than I experienced going, you know, overseas because I was a little older. And again, it's really tender time. Um, And I didn't know anything about Indiana before coming. And so it just shocked me. Whereas moving to (laughs) Tokyo, you know, we talked about it a lot. It felt like this big deal to talk about moving to another country. Um, But it just shocked me. Um, I remember, you know, from from the very beginning being driven to school and just um, I had never lived somewhere where there was so much space, mm. you know, just like farmland and just so much space. And it was like shocking to me. I'm like, how long, how far I thought it felt like the school was two hours away. Sure. So there was that, which, you know, that's just a different place. Um, but then on my first day of school, um, there were kids like strangers that walked up to me. I mean, classmates ultimately, you know, they're like, are you the new Hawaiian girl? Are you Mexican? Are you Chinese? I mean, just like, just felt so bold, like right. audaciously asking me where I was from. Um, and I just, no, no, you know, <laughs> from California, do you know how to surf? I mean, just like really odd questions. And it was a while ago. It wasn't a very diverse school. Um, and I remember also walking into my homeroom class. And for the first time, I remember looking around the classroom, um, for the first time in the U.S., realizing I don't look like anybody in this class. Like, mm. I, and I don't think I'd really thought, no, like, felt that or noticed that before. Sure. And so that made me want to hide kind of instinctively. And I, I remember going home and trying to, for whatever reason, in my mind at that time, my 14-year-old mind, it's like I need to find the baggiest and darkest clothes I can possibly find. I mean, it doesn't even really, like, make sense. But the the instinct to want to hide, to not be asked things, to not look different, yeah. that's how it played out for me. Um, and And no one was being, you know, outright and mean. But it just right. felt like it was just like an obliviousness. Yeah, to it. yeah. And then I remember seeing my first, and uh, the first time I saw another Asian person who ended up being like a, a dear friend. Um, it was in math class. I walked in, I saw her, and just went straight to her, which I don't think I would have ever done in any situation before, but it literally was like me trying to survive. It was like an instinct. There's someone and we're not even, I mean, she's Vietnamese. Like it's not even, it wasn't even like we had similar experiences, but I'm like, there's another Asian person. Surely she knows or understands some, something that I'm feeling right now. So, yeah. Well, that's so interesting to think about this one moment, this one other person who shares even similar features to yourself, just another Asian person. If that person would have not been in your class, because you, like you said, you know, you became good right, friends and right. you formed this bond, like as a mode of survival, surviving the s- situation you find yourself in, had that not been there, where would your life have gone? Like what yeah. would that path have looked like, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's yeah, so she, interesting. She was a lifeline for sure. Um, What was your writing and your journaling like at this time? Were you able to get some of these thoughts out on the page in your journals or was it like... I can't even process. I'm just going to stay within yeah. myself. I mean, I think for a while I didn't. So just kind of, you know, was holding a lot in mm-hmm. because I didn't, I didn't even understand what I was feeling. I knew um, that I was sad. And looking back now, I'm like, that was a long season of depression. Sure. You know, didn't want to get up, didn't want to engage with anyone. Um, but again, didn't have language at the time. Um so I wasn't journaling for a long time. And actually, one of the things that kind of pushed me back towards writing again was there was an assignment in one of my English classes, and um, I had procrastinated. So I was mad that I had to do it. I don't remember what the prompt was, but whatever it was, it was something about Noblesville or the place that we lived in. Mm. And whatever it was, it just made me really mad. It kind of tipped me over the edge. And so I kind of just rage wrote this paper, turned it in, 
because I'm like, I have to turn it in to get a grade. <laughs> um, and then after I turned it in, I was like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? Because I kind of had been mute for years. Sure. So no one had seen me angry, just kind of holding all this in. And now I'm like, I just turned this into my teacher, you know? Um, and he was a great teacher, but the next day he announced to the class, like, pulls up the paper. I'm like, you know, shaking. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he was like just making a comment about how the writing was really good because it was really honest. Mm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, please don't read this, you know, out loud. <laughs> it was so, because it was so, I was so angry. There was so much like in me, you know, that I hadn't healed from. So it was yeah. derogatory towards everyone <laughs> around me, just not kind. Um, and, but it was true. It was how I actually felt yeah. about <laughs> most of the, the places that I was in at the time. Um, so he kind of, encouraged me through that and I think I started picking up my journal again or just okay. writing a little bit more like okay there's power in being honest about what we're feeling I yeah. wasn't ready to share that with the whole class but it gave me something that he read it and responded to it and could hold that anger yeah and wasn't condemning me for it was like this well, like is recognizing it for what yeah, it was this is important yeah. um so so I always like just held that in the back of my mind for a long time and that kind of motivated me again like okay this is how I can communicate right now um, yeah in a safe way. <laughs> I, no, I, I love it because yeah. it's, you hear a lot of these origin stories for, for writers or for creatives who had that one teacher who kind of nurtured that yeah. in them. And I feel like in Indiana, especially for people of the global majority, you may not always have that. Right. You know, especially yeah. if you find yourself in a predominantly white space where there's nobody else who looks like you. Right. Who can really resonate with that experience. You'd also don't necessarily think, oh, this person is going to recognize that. And even if they can't resonate with it, he at least could recognize the emotion yeah. and the honesty yeah. that was that you imbued mm -hmm. onto the page. Yeah, I thought I was going to get in trouble. So, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, what does that even mean? I don't know. Well, that's how you know it's honest. Yeah. Like, you know, when I feel like as kids, and especially as teenagers, when you do something that you really believe in, I think there's always this fear of consequence. Yeah. Like, oh, I just did something bad. And actually, it's that's just making me think about why I rejected my identity for so long is because mm -hmm. I felt like being Asian was wrong. Yeah. And so I didn't ever want to vocalize what it was that I was feeling or why I felt that way or why I didn't want to be Asian. You know, I would just lean into the derogatory aspects of it because I felt like it was bad. And yeah. if I voiced that, then I was going to get in trouble for some reason. Mm -hmm. And now that just made me sad to think about my young self, but it's fine. Oh. We're in a good <laughs> space now. We're in a good space. Um, all of these experiences that you just talked about are hit, laced within the pages of Tell Me the Dream Again. And so not to just skip from, oh, I was in high school and I was just finding my voice again, but to now where you're mm. at. But can we talk a little bit about the book? Can you tell us, let's start here. What prompted you to know that this was the right time to put my experiences on the page and put this out? Yeah. Um, I don't think I ever feel, and I don't know about other writers, but like, this is the definite moment. Um, but I will say, so this book actually started in a college class. So decades ago, okay. um, I took a memoir class and had some other, you know, writing teachers that were, again, very formative, um, but took a memoir class and had this experience with, you know, 12 other students where we read memoir together. And this was a time when... Um, People were, some people were even saying that memoir is not even a genre. It shouldn't be mm. considered a genre. So it was kind of new. Um, but we read these memoirs, and I was just so moved by the impact that the memoirs had on us as a class. And then, um, you know, our discussions. And then also our, our assignment was to write, like, a little mini memoir. Okay. And so um, at that time, when I sat down to write, all I could, all that would come out I mean, I'm like, I don't have anything to share, but all that would come out were like stories about my mom mm. and, and which seems so different than my upbringing, right? Um, she grew up, you know, post Japanese colonial rule, yep. post war, I mean, during the war for some of her childhood. Um, so I did not grow up like that, but there were all these stories that she had told me, you know, interspersed throughout my childhood that would be popping back in my mind. And there was a connection I could see between those and some of the stuff that I was going through for the first time. Mm. So that's kind of what would come out. Um, and so I started it, but it was just this short little, this tiny little, you know, mini memoir and then shared it. We had to read it out loud with the class. And that experience just, I think hearing other people's um, 
their stories, yeah. watching them share really vulnerably. Um, I had never been in a situation where people had shared some vulnerable stuff in that way with a group. Um, but just watching like the class kind of turn tender towards each other, it's really transformative for me. Um, so, but then I put that away cause it was a great experience, but I just hadn't lived enough to finish it, you know? Sure. So it sat in a box. I had this old picture of my mom on the cover had like bound it, um, sat in a box for, decades. And then, um, you know, about 10 years ago, I started writing more publicly. I mean, still have been writing. And what started coming out in some of the articles or things that I would post online were these bits and pieces that connected to that initial story. And mm. so after 10 years, it was kind of clear to me, there's a whole book here. Yeah. Um, and I just feel ready to write it. Like I just felt like there was, it's just something in me that just wants to come out. Yeah. So, um, and I hadn't felt that before. I mean, I'd felt aware of it in some kind of weird abstract way, Sure. but then it just felt like I just need to get it out. I need yeah. to, you know, it needs to be released. Um, so started writing, started, um, writing some sample chapters and pitching it and, went through all the work of like trying to find an agent and getting like, you know, the, the stuff fun that, book stuff. Well, <laughs> the, yeah, the but it feels stuff. like oh, so much work is this even worth it, you know? Sure. Um, but yeah, but it felt like, okay, to honor this thing that feels like it needs to be released. This is the work that needs to be done. And now it's time. And so that was, what was that? Well, this signed the book deal in 2020. Yeah. So yeah. And then usually I think I've heard two years to release after signing a deal normally. Yeah. Did this come out in 21 or 22? It actually came out in 23. Oh, 23. So it was longer, okay. but there was a huge delay. We had to actually push the release date back because of there were books like falling off of shipping containers. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> there was a lot going on with COVID. And so, um, so yeah, it released later than we had initially planned. But it was a long time coming. I mean, yeah. it was done, you know, a year or two before it released. So Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I want to go back to when you first started to write this in college as a prompt. And I appreciate you sharing how hearing other people share vulnerably, mm. like brought you into the space of community and writing, because I feel like I always for a long time thought about writing as a solitary, isolating act. And I majored in creative writing when I was in college. And I think one of the reasons that I dropped out was because I felt so isolated, mm -hmm. even when we were doing like workshops and stuff together, it just felt like this is for, this is my own thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like I could find that community. It seems like you found it in those classes. You said you called it transformative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that one class, that memoir class was different than all the other okay, creative okay. writing classes sure, that sure, I was sure. in. Memoir specifically. Um, and it was just that class, the way that the teacher led that class. Mm. I mean, he was like a Mr. Rogers. He would come in with his thermos and drink his tea and just, I don't know, kind of let us lead. And we actually did lead, you know, classes, but it, it was it was just a really beautiful experience. Um, I wouldn't say that we walked away, you know, tight knit friends, but there was something beautiful sure. in the in the creating together. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think a lot of it was the nature of writing memoir, you yeah. know, digging into these are real things, you know, that we're talking about and which, you know, I, I don't know, given a different teacher and a different set of classmates, who knows right. what it would have been like, right? You well, know, I think so. and memoir is interesting because like you said, a lot of times people were at that time pushing back against yeah. the idea of memoir, because I guess it was probably all biography, autobiography, where people are writing about someone else. Is yeah, that how yeah. that Before goes? Before that, yeah. yeah. Where memoirs are very much a, a first person yeah. look into this is my life. Yeah. And at that time, I mean, the memoirs that we read in that class, they weren't like famous people. You know, sure. you have like the famous, the celebrity memoirs, right. totally different, you know, different audience. But the, these were just other writers. They were talking about their lives. Um, and it was, you know, creative nonfiction. And, Interesting. Um, yeah. And then some of those writers that we read, Mary Carr was one who I think is an incredible memoirist. Okay. But she, we read her first memoir and she's gone on. Now she teaches somewhere. And so, I mean, I think yeah. they, it's a legitimate genre. You know? Mary, but she kind of made it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mary yeah. Carr, I was going to, I was going to ask any, anyone in particular that stuck out to you, anyone else besides Mary that you were like, oh, this is what I want to do maybe in the future. Well, I didn't point. know that I would want to write memoir. I knew that I wanted to write. Um, but I think originally I thought I would do fiction because it felt safer. Mm. I still sometimes want to do that, but it felt like this is a way to tell stories, um, you know, without throwing someone under the bus or throwing, sure. myself, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and just, you know, and add some creative flair to it, you yeah. know? So, um, but she was influential. Um, other writers were just, 
I mean, other Asian American writers at that time, which not, weren't necessarily writing memoir, but just the, the, some of the first books that I read that where I saw, oh my gosh, this this is like kind of similar to my story. It makes yeah. sense, you know, a representation, you know, on the page, which I had not experienced ever up until that point. So, yeah. um, I love that. Okay, can you give us a little bit of a synopsis of the book? I feel like we talked about maybe the first yeah. third of it in the beginning <laughs> yeah, we, of I this interview. About a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I um. And I don't want to like spoil obviously all of it, but uh, we'd love to hear just from you, yeah. like, kind of what we can expect going. Yeah. In. So it it kind of starts with um, a dream that my mom had, um, and so the, hence the title "Tell Me the Dream Again." So that's something that I actually said to her repeatedly when I was younger. Um, so she had this dream about a night sky and one of the you know, kind of constellations or stars turning into a tiger. And then she would tell me that tiger's you. And, you know, tigers are a big part of Korean culture. Um, but she would tell me this. And because of some of the ways um, that I struggled, just like seeing how I fit or how I belonged, that image was so far reaching for me, like mm -hmm. to think of myself as a tiger in any way. Um, but it was always my favorite animal when I was younger. And so it starts with that. Um, and then it moves into kind of a lot of you know, it's memoir and essays, but vignettes um, from my mom's story and from my story um, of rejecting a lot of my Koreanness um, as I tried to figure out who I was and then moving back to an embrace of that. And so that involves all aspects like motherhood, marriage, um, my faith journey, which that's a whole another part of it, which um, for I kind of hit a dead end where I felt like... Um, this isn't for me if I don't know how to include mm. my whole self, my ethnic sure. self. And so there's a lot of that in there as well. Um, yeah. And then it's, it's also kind of like a love note to my mom. Yeah. So. I love it. Um, how do you, how did you find yourself during the process? You talk about hitting this dead end of not being able, or you want to make sure that you're including your whole self. How do you find the balance in the writing process of being able to pull those different parts of you into the book mm -hmm. and then knowing, okay, I'm, I'm removed this barrier and I can move forward now. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it was something that was very conscious to me as I was writing. I do know that, um, while writing, there would be some times where I would hit a block. Um, and I don't even, I don't know if it's met writer's block or whatever, but just feel like I couldn't keep going. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, you know, that I was tired or it was just like, it just felt like there was a barrier. Um, and so in those times, I think sometimes there was something that I need to work through a little bit more. Mm. Most of the things in the book are things that I have talked about very openly for a while, have written about. They're not new. Sure. Um, um, very comfortable talking about the stories where even, you know, someone might be reading them for the first time and be like, whoa, I didn't know that that happened. But for me, it, it. I yeah. processed, you know, through it. But there, so there were a couple of times where it felt like there was a barrier um, and I had to kind of think through, like, dig deep um, as to why, you know, yeah. if it was, am I afraid to to bring a part of me? Sure. You know, is there fear there? Um, am I worried about what someone's going to think and who? Who am I? What mm. am I? You know, kind of explore some of that yeah. um, before moving forward. So. That's like a part of your own healing process. Cause it seems like, you know, you're yeah. comfortable telling a lot of these stories you've told them yeah. before and it's like, okay, maybe I've healed at, to a certain point with those, but these barriers are okay. What else can I heal? Right. Right. Yeah. And what else, what else do I need to say to add mm. to what's already there? Um, and am I ready to mm. do I have permission to, um, especially because it's involving other people. Right. So there's that whole element as well. Um, there were times where I had to go back and talk to my mom who had given me permission to, in her words, write about anything I've told you. Um, but then I would kind of go back with a specific story. What about sure. this? Um, so, and there were a lot of things I just sometimes would start writing about and thought, you know what, even though she gave me permission, I don't, I don't want to put this. Sure. Some of that's for you. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's, yeah. it's like, it's maybe not too personal, but it's, right. it's those intimate moments. Like we don't have to give everything away. Right. You know, um, protective, yeah. you know, of the other people in my life too. Well, so. I think that's what's hard about a memoir yeah. is to not only write for yourself and write your story, but knowing that these other people in your life are going to be play significant yeah. parts and being like, how much do I go and edit with them like how much do I give them right. before what was that process like for you like said, uh, you know you went talk to your mom yeah. a little bit but yeah with her it was different because we've talked about a lot of these sure. stories a lot um and she's pretty open um 
yeah. So that was a little bit different. But there were a couple things, you know, I wrote about a time with a friend um, where we didn't see eye to eye. And I just wrote it. Because I think sometimes if I think too much about it, um, it's hard to get it on the page, you know, yeah. so just wrote it. And then I just sent it to her, <laughs> like, tell me your <laughs> honest thoughts. Like, are you OK if this is, you know, published and out? And a lot of times it's something I mean, in that instance in particular, we're close friends. We've talked that through. Yeah. It's not like um, it happened and we're not friends anymore and I'm writing about it, though. Some some writers feel completely comfortable sure. doing that. And I don't I mean, I think it's it's kind of personal preference, like what you want to live with in the aftermath. And, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. Well, how prepared are you for <laughs> right. any consequence that might come? Right. Right. And some people are more secure in that right. and dealing right. with that than other people. Who, Anne Lamont says, you know, I think if, if people didn't want you to write about them, they should have treated you better. And so there's truth to that. Very know? true. That is very true. So. Yeah. Any risks that I take in that way, to me, I think it's worth it because it's something that I feel like is hopefully going to help people see a little differently. Sure. And um, and there's needed change here. So I'm going to write about it anyway. Yeah. And, you know, if you feel a little, I don't know, I don't know bothered, that's okay. It's worth it. You <laughs> no, know? I think so, it's, well, yeah. if you feel bothered, that means you're being challenged. Yeah. And I think the challenging parts are good right. because if we are challenging those preconceived notions that we already hold then that means we've got areas that we need to grow yeah that we probably need to heal within ourselves and i love the book because it's specifically talking about this biracial multiracial mixed race experience um what was it like to really dive into something that we just still don't see a lot of. I'm working with mixed Asian media on stuff yeah. to t have more of these conversations, especially because I have a mixed race child now. Yeah. But what was it like as, you know, from that first person perspective to be like, I'm going to talk about something very personal, very intimate that I know deeply within right. my soul, um, but that we don't talk about a lot. And that really challenges a lot of just general notions about what that means. Yeah. Um, well, it felt a little bit of an urgency, I think, after having kids, too. So I've got mixed race kids, too. Um, having kids, that changed things. But also just learning that, you know, the mixed race population is the fastest growing demographic in the nation. Um, it's not going away. And so the fact that we don't have much language for ourselves. <laughs> I mean, sure. I didn't have any. Um, but the fact that this is a reality I mean, it's going to be a reality wherever you go in our country. Like, yeah. this is the group, you know, that um, is going to be the majority here. Um, it matters. And so I think I felt a little urgency in that. Like, why not speak, you know, sure. and tell the story? Um, and I think, too, just coming to a place of healing and feeling so comfortable as a mixed race person, you know, for I don't know however many years now. But it it's it's freeing. It's liberating. Um, it I think to be able to speak from that perspective um, is a privilege, you know? And yeah. so um, I don't want to shy away from that if I, if I, if I can, you know, yeah, or if absolutely. I, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to shy I, away yeah. from it if you don't have to shy away from it. Maybe? Or just like I have for so long, you sure. know, I mean, there was so long that I didn't say anything because I felt like it didn't fit the narrative of, um, you know, my mom's side or my dad's side. Right. And so there's nowhere. Well, yeah, and like to navigate both of these worlds yeah. is so difficult because you're not navigating your own. Yeah. Like you are being split down mm -hmm. the seams, even though nobody may be directly saying you have to be this way or the, the other way. Like you, we, we want you to just be Tasha. Yeah. But um, for the person living that experience, it's like, uh, well, I don't know how to move in here and or that way. And you said it's been a few years or it's been a while now since you found that comfortability. Do you remember what it was like to find yourself not only accepting of this mixed race identity, but to like love and lean into mm. what that means to walk the world that way? Yeah. And navigate that particular world. Um, I think it's just freeing. I mean, I think realizing that my whole life has been a both and mm. like that's something that people are saying more in language. But that's I mean, that's an embodied thing for me and sure. for many others. Um, and so it's freeing. It's freeing. I don't feel like I have to pretend like I know more than I do about Korean culture. Mm. I don't feel like I don't know. There's just a lot of things that go along with that. Um, and it's not perfect. There are days where I where I struggle, sure. you know, or something happens and I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's really hard, but, but mostly it just feels freeing to just show up as I am, to not know things, to ask questions, to 
like a lot of the things that we've been doing with our family is trying to embrace, you know, some traditions that I didn't really grow up with. Sure. Though looking back, my mom did mention, but didn't give us a name for. She kind of just uh, was letting it go. Yeah. So to kind of embrace those things again, but then also be honest with my kids, like, but I don't actually know how to do this. So we have to like keep looking it sure. up and like, I don't have the language for it. I'm trying to learn it in the car you know? <laughs> and they're hearing me mess it up yeah. and, you know, not sound right. Um, but, but it's been freeing just to, to learn and to, to claim, yes, I am also part of the Korean American mm. community. I'm not like those Korean Americans, but we're, we're all part of the community right. and it, and all of our voices matter. So to kind of, um, I guess live that out with my family has been really freeing. It's been freeing to show up that way in the spaces that I, you yeah. know, I'm a part of and Absolutely. say something and not feel like I have to give a disclaimer, yeah. you know, even though people still are like, wait, what, you know, <laughs> they still ask things and sure. want to understand, like it doesn't fit the narrative that they've had. Right. But, but that's but part that's of that okay. challenge exactly. for other people exactly. to learn and, as someone who's been able to live the experience, you can be the teacher they need in that moment. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that. I love this idea of learning with your kids because that's where I'm at. I think I before early pregnancy, I was really struggling with the idea of what it means to be Korean. And I started to really identify more as Asian American mm. than Korean American because I just couldn't find... I was like, I can't connect. Uh, there's this gap here. Yeah. And every time I try and leap across to get to the other side, I fall short. And mm -hmm. I was just like, you know, I, it's, it feels like it's not for me. Um, and now that Van is here, um, shout out to Van, <laughs> I am, I'm liking this idea of we'll just learn it together. And yeah. as much as I want to be the teacher, I'm like, I was never in the position to teach in the first place. And there were all these times where I was made to be a teacher where I couldn't teach and then felt inadequate all the times where I was a student and felt inadequate. And now it's like, what are the ways that I can find ethnic and cultural connection with my with my kid yeah. or kids if there we have more than one child? And how can I live into that, especially when they have an experience that I won't have right. of being mixed race? And so I appreciate you sharing this experience because it's just making me light up inside to know, okay, I can do that with them yeah. as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You totally can. And I think it gives them a map too for not just their, you know, embracing their racial or ethnic identity, but just for how to live. You know, yeah. it's okay to not know. It's okay to move towards things that are important to you and also to not have it all mapped out ahead of time. You know? Yeah, well, that's a good, it's a great idea of what freedom means mm -hmm. because like you said, it's freeing and it feels freeing to me to be like, okay, I can maybe let go of this more knowing that they can see me fail and know that it's okay to do so as if we can keep going or yeah. whatever that looks like. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, man, I've been doing this a lot where I forget where I was wanted to go because <laughs> I get caught up on something else uh, because it's so amazing. Oh, I do remember where I want to go. Um, cut that out. <laughs> um, you talk about how you started to connect with more Korean culture and you're doing that with your family and you're doing it, you do so throughout the book. And that's one of the things that I really love about it is how you entwine those bits and pieces into it. And I don't want to necessarily be putting you on the spot, but I want to ask you this question because two things that I think are really present throughout the book, even if they're not really named until the latter half, are the concepts of Han and Jung. Mm. Um, I'm wondering if you can share your personal definitions for each of those concepts and how they impact the way that you navigate the world. Mm -hmm. Well, Jung, and if you read the book, you'll know that that's my mom's name. <laughs> um, so that was the first time that I ever heard that. So it's very associated with her as a person. Um, and then later learned, um, you know, when we went to Korea actually once, one time, my husband and I, um, I saw it everywhere. And I was like, that's my mom's name, you know? And then later learned that it meant, it, um, well, and these are the words that are so hard to translate right. into English. And so it feels like you're giving this little tidbit, but like love, connection, like like so many things, right? right. Not just um, care. Um, so that's, and, and it's really meaningful to me because it's all wrapped up in my mom's name and my relationship yeah. with her now. That's a personal bit to it, not a Korean uh, thing. Um, but so there's that. And then Han is something I learned later. And I just saw a post today about it, which was so interesting. So that's in the back <laughs> of my head, you know, but, um, I learned about it as, you know, this, 
deep feeling of it could be rage, anger, resentment, like so many things that Koreans carry as a collective yep. um, that connects them. And that also can be linked to everything that Koreans have been through, like so much oppression, you know, yeah. and have survived. And um, but when I first heard the word and the term and someone trying to explain it, because, again, it's it's you can't really translate it into English. Um, what I imagined was my mom leaning over um the sink, washing dishes, singing in Korean and weeping. Like, mm. And just and that, that, that didn't happen just once. That happened multiple times. And I would ask her later, are you okay? Like what, what's wrong? And it was just so much pain yeah. that she carried, um, which I, of course, as a kid didn't have words for, but I watched her carry this. I watched the, you know, outward expression of it. And it was present in my entire childhood, like just with her. As I learned more and more of the stories and got older, I think I, could recognize, you know, what now I know to be intergenerational trauma. And so right. to me, I connect those dots um, that this pain has been passed down through generations. I felt it as a kid, even though I hear I am growing up in a completely different circumstance, you know, and situation. Um, and so that's kind of, that's, yeah, that's, it's not really a definition, but yeah. Well, that's what, <laughs> I mean, I think it's very Korean to have your own definition for the, for the <laughs> concepts, because I feel like, we get put on the spot to try to define them. And the reason I wanted to ask, I just wanted to hear kind of how you define yeah. it for yourself, because I do feel like throughout the book, both Han and Jong are very present because I feel like you can feel like the deep emotion, the, the intimate emotions that are carried throughout, not just from you, but through your mother's story. And then also not just because her name is Jong, but because there is this deep care rooted in yeah the stories that are being told as well as the way you are telling and relaying these stories mm. that are both yours and your mother's. I feel like it is, it is so Korean <laughs> to find ways, even if unintentional to live into each of those things mm -hmm. and carry them mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I think that they're all part of all of our identities and for anybody, anybody can feel Han or yeah. Han. Anybody can feel Jung. And I think the best, my, the, my favorite definition that I ever heard for Han was a loss of identity. Mm -hmm. um, I heard that from Professor Michael Shin through a Korea Society talk. And he talked about it that way because as a country, we're split in two. And we all, at intergenerational trauma, we all carry that, whether you're part of the, whether you're on the, in the diaspora on the continent or outside of it. Right. Like, we are all children of this schism, of this loss of identity for the entire continent or yeah. the country. Um, and I feel like your story and the book itself is about reclaiming, for me, those pieces of our identity yeah and in, if not making it whole moving along the path of healing to wholeness yeah. and that's, that's what right. i really love about it i've never heard that definition that's yeah. perfect yeah, yeah i heard that right as i started to or i came to consciousness was going through my own journey i was like oh that makes a lot of sense yeah. it's to like explain the deep emotion whether it be anger rage sadness yeah. melancholy like it was like oh okay it's because we're trying to figure out who we are, not only as an individual person, but as a collective. Yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, you also talk about, I want to touch on this too before we wrap up here, uh, your faith journey. It's a big mm -hmm. part of the book as well. Mm -hmm. um, what's it like balancing that part with the ethnic identity, with the everything else that goes on in social context? What's it like to bring in that faith piece? Yeah. Because it is so fundamental to yourself yeah um so when i'm just by myself or with my family or safe community it it's a no-brainer it's just what is now um but in certain situations in certain social environments um it can be really difficult um you know i became a christian i don't know what at a, at a younger age or at, at you know when i was a lot younger um and for a long time, that whole, everything about that was wrapped up in the communities I was in. Mm. And it didn't have, there was no space for my ethnic identity or my racial identity. There wasn't, there, no one was talking about that. Um, yeah. 
And so I, you know, I remember wanting to talk to this woman who would sit and pray. She was like a mentor to me and wanting to talk to her about some things I was going through with my mom and realizing like she has no idea what I'm talking about. Like just this, you know, she can't, not that she can't help me, but like this, this part, there's no space for this here. Sure. And so anyway, as my faith journey goes on, um, there was a point where I think I thought, you know, if there's not going to be room for this, um, if I can't work through what I actually believe um, with my ethnic, my ethnicity, um, my racial experiences very much tied to it, then I don't, I don't want to be a part of it mm. anymore. And so um, there was a long time of wrestling. And I think what I came back to, too, was a lot of my faith was kind of passed down the core of it. So not just... Um, those years where I was just learning from, you know, a church youth group or something. Sure. And and I wouldn't say that those are bad. They're definitely formative, um, but they, they couldn't have held me for much longer than they sure. did. Um, so a lot of it was passed down from my parents. Um, and it was a very different expression than what I learned in um, some church communities mm. in the Midwest, if that, yep. you know. Um, my mom was someone who would watch what I like to call Jesus movies, like really old <laughs> ones, and um, she would weep on the floor. And, you know, I remember as a kid being really impacted by her response because she didn't respond that way to much else outside sure. of like remembering some of her past. Um, and so that was, that really shaped me in a way that I didn't have words for or realize until much later when I was kind of wrestling, like, what is actually, what do I actually believe? Sure. Um, is this something? Cause it was either going to be all thrown out or, um, I would move forward, but I wouldn't, I wasn't willing to move forward as just, part of myself you know yeah. what i call like assimilated really you right. know into this colonial like i don't know yeah. you know structure and so um so that really i needed to kind of come to that dead end and wrestle even though it was very uncomfortable um and figure out what i actually believed and what was really important to me and i think coming through that um again was freeing um it's helped me define some things for myself um, and not wait for someone else's definition and also kind of question some things that have been around me um, just because someone said they should be that way, you know. Sure. Um, it's also been difficult, too, because I think staying true to myself um, in, you know, a faith that has a long history and a lot of different kinds of people involved is um, – is beautiful on one hand and it's also it can be really difficult so yeah. um so there's a there's a mix there's a big tension there um trying to live it out honestly and some days are really hard <laughs> so. yeah well i think that honesty comes out in the book yeah. within the pages and i feel like um we talked about like challenging others and challenging the general society's ideas of ethnicity and race and particularly of the mixed race experience and i think that through f your faith journey i think it's a great model for what it looks like to also accept those challenges within ourselves yeah and to know that it's not just about challenging outward but also inward so yeah. we can also grow and heal yeah. and move and move forward in that way so i appreciate you sharing that um book's been out for almost a year almost a year so may may 2023 okay so, perfect yeah, so yes <laughs> it has been out for a year um what have you learned about yourself during this time hmm um I mean, I feel like I was meant to write the book and it was supposed to release, but nothing really changes, you know? Mm. Uh, it's not like you write a book and it's out there and your whole life changes. Sure. Like the very regular life and, right. <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't change much um, while at the same time it feels like it was necessary and needed to happen. Um, I, I have learned that I need some regular rhythms. Um, I think putting the work... Well, doing the creative work and then putting it out there is exhausting. Mm. Um, and it it was very exhausting, I think, especially right after it released. Um, it just required so much emotional work, not to mention time of just, you know, trying to promote it. And, yeah. um, and so I've really needed to pay attention to my capacity, my need to just not have anything book related and just be outside like digging in our you know, <laughs> dirt, like just doing things right. to care, like care for the yard or go outside. Um, things that um, really kind of balance out some of that work, that mental and emotional work. Yeah. Um, so I've learned that I have to pay attention to that like really closely. Otherwise I can just 
do a deep dive. I so, love it. Yeah. All great lessons for yeah. all of us to internalize for yeah. sure. Um, well, I appreciate you being here with us. I appreciate you sharing so much of your story. That is also in the book. Make sure you go <laughs> and get the book. Um, as we wrap up here, always got to end on this question. How do we best support you going forward? Where do we get Tell Me the Dream Again? And where do we find you? Yeah. Um, so it's sold wherever books are sold. So, um, I mean, online, lots of different places. Um, so, yeah, best support by the book is, like, the best thing. Um, you know, when we buy books, like, by certain um, authors in a certain demographic, it tells people that those books are important, those mm. stories are important. So um, that, um, as far as online, I'm on Instagram probably the most, Tasha June B. Um, and then I have a newsletter, but it can all be found through Instagram. So Perfect. Yeah. Well, you can find all of those things in the show notes as well, as well as where you can buy the book. And make sure you go out and buy the book and leave a review after you read it. Um, I'm bad about leaving reviews until I get the emails reminding me to leave reviews. So make sure that you do that uh, because it also really helps out authors and helps visibility and lets them know that you enjoyed the book and what you enjoyed about it. So um, Tasha, thank you so much for sharing your story and for being here. It's been a big privilege and honor. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, everybody else, you know, episodes every Tuesday. Um, at Conversation Pod Piece on Instagram if you want to follow us. ConversationPeacePod.com for your archives and everything else. we got cool stuff coming up here in the month of May, Asian Heritage Month. Ran out of time to talk to you about that, <laughs> but we'll bring you back to talk about it again at another time. Um, other than that, we got a lot of really cool stuff coming up, a lot of really great conversations. Until next time, and until then, I have been the titular Patrick. This has been Conversation Peace, and we'll see you all soon.